a Victorian council set to open its briefing sessions to the public. The high cost of asbestos cleanup in the western suburbs revealed unhappy rural councillors make controversial calls. A deputy mayor resigns three months out from elections. Sydney councils in the news as Liverpool goes to court and police are called to Canterbury Bankstown. In Queensland, strike action and a senior staff exodus making news and a vandal goes on a rampage against a council building in Western Australia. All of that and more just ahead on the local government news roundup. Good morning, it's Friday the 26th of July 2024. I'm Chris Eddy. This is the Local Government News Roundup. Also today... The market hasn't been challenged in over 20 years. We're looking to remove those barriers, remove those costs and actually support certainly small suppliers, but in fact all suppliers, to be able to put their best foot forward when offering their services to government. I take a look at a new disruptor in the market looking to shake things up in local government procurement. My interview with Michael Robinson later in the podcast. Our program is brought to you as always by the Victorian Local Governance Association, the national broadcaster on all things local government. We start with a roundup of stories making news around Victoria in local government circles this week. And Mornington Peninsula Shire Council has voted to open briefing sessions to the public online and to provide more information about briefing topics in advance of council decisions. The decision follows a review of the council's public transparency policy, which was referred to a citizens panel and subject to community consultation. The proposal to amend a published officer recommendation was put forward at this week's council meeting by Councillor David Gill and ultimately it received majority councillor support after an hour of questioning and debate. Council CEO John Baker told the meeting that time would be required to develop meeting rules and terms of reference for the open briefing sessions and it's unclear if the change will take effect before elections in October. While some other Victorian councils have explored opening their briefing sessions to the public, Mornington Peninsula is believed to be the first in the state to enact such a change. Some councils in other states have opened their briefing sessions to the public, notably in South Australia. Kiama Council in New South Wales held a trial of open briefing sessions in 2022 and there's movement towards open council workshops in New Zealand following an ombudsman recommendation last year. Ratepayers in Hobson's Bay are facing over $500,000 in costs to remove asbestos-contaminated mulch from public parks, according to a report from The Age this week. The article quotes figures from an internal memo revealing the costs to be far in excess of the previous estimates of around $200,000. The final cost will not be known until remediation of the last site is completed, expected to be sometime next month. The contamination discovered in at least 11 parks was believed to be from illegal dumping or pre-existing conditions rather than suppliers. The council has been unable to link the issue to contractors and must therefore cover the remediation costs. A Northern Grampians Shire councillor has called on the local government minister to appoint a municipal monitor. Councillor Lauren Dempsey says she's written to the Minister outlining her concerns about councillor conduct and behaviour that has led to her not attending briefings due to what she describes as a psychologically unsafe and toxic environment. Six Victorian councils have municipal monitors in place currently, the most recent appointments being made at Colac Otway and Bullock Shires. Horsham Rural City Council has finally adopted its budget after delays dealing with alternate motions and councillor concerns about the impact of rising rates on farmers. The weekly advertiser reported that there was some confusion about the voting process and some heated debate before the budget was passed, with three councillors voting against it. Some of the councillors delivered a scathing assessment of the council as a whole, fuelled by a perceived poor performance rating in the latest community satisfaction survey results. At least one member of the public was ejected from the meeting by Mayor Robin Galeen. 
Hepburn Shire Councillor Juliet Simpson has resigned, effective the 22nd of July. Councillor Simpson was elected in 2020 and has served as Deputy Mayor since November last year. There will be no by-election due to the proximity of the general election in October and the Holcombe Ward seat will remain vacant until then. And the Roundup has confirmed that the Council does not intend to elect a new Deputy Mayor for the remaining three months of the Council term. Macedon Ranges Shire Council has expanded its curbside soft plastics recycling program and opened a new resale shop at the Romsey Resource Recovery Facility funded by a grant from Sustainability Victoria. A soft plastics recycling trial in Romsey was described as encouraging, leading to an expansion of the initial 12-month trial. The new resale shop is the second in the Shire, allowing residents to donate and purchase reusable goods, helping reduce landfill waste and supporting the community's transition to a circular economy. Some Victorian Council news briefs for you. Kingston Councillor Hardy Saab has been elected to the MAV board in a by-election triggered by the resignation of former Kingston Councillor Steve Stakos. Councillor Saab joins the board as the new Metropolitan South Region representative. Greater Shepparton City Council will not proceed with a proposed avenue of flags following community consultation. Instead, it will promote the use of the existing community flagpole in the Queen's Gardens in Shepparton. Respondents to the consultation generally favoured alternative methods to acknowledge the region's diversity. Mooney Valley City Council has officially opened a new bike track at Fanny Street Reserve with jumps, safety balustrades and additional amenities. The project was developed with input from the community and designed by the Trail Collective and funded in part by a $300,000 government grant. The construction of new $520,000 accessible public toilet facilities and a changing place in Elmore has been delayed due to the discovery of an undetected water main under the build site. The city of Greater Bendigo has had to change the location of the new building. And Wyndham City Council will advocate to the state government for the Port Phillip prison site to be transformed into a mixed-use development similar to Pentridge Prison rather than being sold exclusively for housing. The council has proposed the establishment of a stakeholder reference group and development of a master plan according to a report from Wyndham TV. You're listening to the Local Government News Roundup, edition number 367, recorded on the morning of Friday the 26th of July 2024. This is the Roundup that does not cause cancer and we don't need a federal court ruling to confirm that. Nor do we need science to tell you it's safe to listen. Thank you for being on board and thank you to the Victorian Local Governance Association for its ongoing support for the Local Government News Roundup. Look out for a new edition of TGU, the panel discussion on governance issues and news from across local government coming away later today on YouTube and on podcast. Council news in New South Wales still dominated by the Liverpool City Council situation. That council has been given an extension of time to respond to the state government's interim investigation report, which led to a plan to suspend the council and defer elections pending a public inquiry. The Office of Local Government has given the council until 5pm next Wednesday to provide its response as to why it should not be suspended. In the meantime, the Council has released details of its legal case against the state, in which it is arguing the Minister and state bureaucrats have exhibited bias and that requirements of procedural fairness have not been met. It's seeking to have the interim report set aside and expunged from the public record and to prevent the Minister from suspending the Council and postponing elections. The Sydney Morning Herald reported that a hearing in the Land and Environment Court yesterday was adjourned to Friday afternoon, that's this afternoon as we record, and a spokesperson for the Minister confirmed that the interim report had been taken offline while the proceedings are on foot. Earlier this week, the Liverpool City Councillors who voted against taking legal action released a statement explaining their position. Councillors Caress Rhodes, Dr Betty Green and Peter Hall said the results of this week's meeting was disappointing for the Liverpool community and that they believe it's essential to support the process of a public inquiry. The dissenting councillors said the interim report from the independent investigation raises serious concerns which should be tested and that a suspension of the council while an inquiry takes place is reasonable and sensible. 
Police were called to a Canterbury Bankstown council meeting this week after a contentious discussion on potentially ending contracts with companies linked to Israel. Labor councillor Chris Carl proposed a motion to review council investments tied to human rights violations against Palestinians, aligning with the BDS campaign. The Daily Telegraph reported that the motion was passed, but the meeting saw interruptions and alleged threats, leading to what has become an ongoing police investigation. Kuringai Council has condemned the alleged theft of a two-metre-high bronze honour roll from Taramurra Memorial Park, which listed the names of 67 local residents who served in World War I. Nine News reported that the honour roll was discovered missing on Monday morning, leaving one pillar of the memorial gate blank. Kuringai Mayor Sam Nagai has called the theft appalling. Hornsby Police are investigating the incident. Penrith City Council has endorsed the Penrith Aerotropolis Development Contributions Plan, which allocates around $830 million for infrastructure in the Western Sydney Aerotropolis Precinct. A ministerial amendment to regulations has allowed an increased levy of 5.6%, up from the previous maximum allowed of 1%. Penrith Mayor Todd Carney said the plan was vital as Western Sydney International Airport was set to be the catalyst for much of the future development in the area. Bega Valley Shire Council will cease providing families, ageing and disability services over the next 11 months, transitioning clients to other providers by June 2025. The decision follows a review indicating a changed provider market with multiple available options. The council will support clients through the transition, collaborating with relevant government departments. The Mayor Russell Fitzpatrick said the decision was not about the quality of current services, but rather out of the need to reassess the council's role in service provision. And Bathurst Regional Council says it will take a zero tolerance approach to serious violations of the Companion Animals Act after an increase in the number of straying and aggressive dogs. Recent incidents include 28 dog attacks in the past year resulting in injuries to 19 people and 30 animals. It's believed that less than half of the dogs in the council are registered. Increased enforcement activities will focus initially on ensuring dogs are microchipped and registered. Some stories out of Queensland now. Around 150 Toowoomba Council workers have taken strike action this week over low wages and a gender pay gap. The Toowoomba Chronicle reported that workers protested outside of Toowoomba City Hall yesterday, demanding an 8% pay increase in the first year of a new pay deal compared to the Council's offer of 6%. The union has highlighted data showing that Toowoomba's indoor council workers are among the lowest paid in comparable local government areas. Council Chief Executive Brian Pidgeon said the council's pay offer is fair given current financial constraints. Fraser Coast Regional Council has extended CEO Ken Deem's contract for 12 months until June 2026. Ken has held the role since 2017 and plans to retire at the end of his contract, calling time on a 40-year career in local government. The council has also appointed its Director of Strategy, Community and Development, Jared Carline, as Deputy CEO. At Cairns, there are reports of a senior staff exodus in the wake of this year's elections, with six senior staff, including the former CEO, having resigned since March, and others tipped to follow soon. The Cairns Post has reported claims that the departures are due to poor relationships with the new Mayor Amy Eden and the interim CEO John Andreak. Mr Andreak's tenure was extended by another three months this week, with concerns raised in the chamber by one councillor about the appointment process and an alleged conflict of interest between the Mayor and the CEO. Those allegations have been reportedly referred to the state's integrity body, the Crime and Corruption Commission, which has not confirmed or made any comment on the matter. A Sunshine Coast resident has been fined $30,000 and ordered to pay over $26,000 in compensation and court costs for illegally clearing vegetation and creating a makeshift driveway without approval. The Calandra Magistrates Court found the man guilty after proceedings against him were commenced by Sunshine Coast Council. Councillor Maria Suarez said the outcome should serve as a warning to those who act against the rules in relation to clearing. More news in brief. Redland City Council is using drones and helicopters alongside traditional methods to combat invasive fire ants on council-owned or managed land. The council's efforts include surveillance, suppression and treatment, with a focus on larger sites like parks and waste transfer stations. Residents are being urged to report any suspected fire ant nests to Biosecurity Queensland. 
The City of Sydney will seek feedback on a 10-year economic development strategy which aims to create 200,000 new jobs, extend transport connections, transition to net zero and foster a diverse 24-hour economy. The strategy envisions a $540 million investment in economic development and $100 million in public domain works. And Sunshine Coast Council is urging the state government to implement mandatory speed limiters on e-transport devices to enhance safety. It's proposed a motion to the LGAQ annual conference seeking statewide support for mandatory device limitations. There were over 3,300 hospital presentations due to e-transport incidents in Queensland from 2019 to 2023. few more stories in our national roundup today before we head to the global roundup and later Michael Robinson joins me from Local Government Contracts Australia to talk about the new disruptor that's entered the market for local government procurement. But firstly, let's go to South Australia where two councils there have welcomed the next steps in seeking realignment of their municipal boundaries. The Local Government Boundaries Commission has determined that proposals from the town of Gawler and Campbelltown City Council can proceed to inquiry stage and has appointed an investigator to prepare a report. The town of Gawler is seeking the inclusion of seven areas within its boundaries that are currently part of Light Regional Council, the Barossa Council and the City of Playfield. Public engagement on the proposal is underway between now and the end of August. Campbelltown City Council is seeking part of Ross Trevor and Woodford and the Hamilton Hill development in the Adelaide Hills Council area to be brought within its boundary. To Western Australia now, and a vandal has smashed more than 60 windows at the City of Vincent Civic offices in Leaderville this week. WA Today reported that the incident occurred on Tuesday night around 10.40, causing an estimated $75,000 in damage. Surrounded businesses were left untouched, leading to initial speculation that the vandal had a particular gripe with the council. A 41-year-old Leaderville man has since appeared in court on charges of destruction of property, possession of testosterone and possession of a prohibited weapon. The West Australian has reported his claims that the council seized and destroyed his dog. Rio Tinto has committed $700,000 over two years to support the City of Perth's annual Christmas Lights Trail, a key festive event that will feature around 20 installations from November 22 to January 1st. The partnership, along with continued support from Lottery West, is aiming to enhance community connection and boost local business by drawing large crowds to the city. The event has seen significant growth since its inception six years ago, with last year's event attracting the highest attendance on record. Carissa Bywater, the CEO of the town of Mossman Park, has announced her resignation after more than five years in the role. She'll leave at the end of October to become Director of Corporate and System Services at the City of Coburn. Carissa is credited with turning around the workplace culture at the council while getting it back on a stable financial footing. And another WA council has announced the appointment of a new CEO. The Shire of Bruce Rock will welcome Mark Furr to the position. He's making the move from the Shire of Narragan, where he's the Executive Manager of Corporate Services. Now a few stories from our global roundup file. We've been keeping an eye on that potential strike action in Scotland where councils are seeking additional funds from the government to prevent bin worker strikes after the unions rejected a 3.2% pay rise. BBC News has reported on the latest developments, noting that previous strikes in 2022 and 2023 were resolved with government financial intervention. COSLA, which represents councils, says no further funds are available without impacting jobs and services, and it's urging the unions to pause the strike action, which could begin in weeks, coinciding with the Edinburgh festival season. The Scottish Government has yet to agree to a meeting. A new report from the Institute for Government and the Nuffield Foundation has highlighted the precarious state of UK public services, noting that most are performing worse than in 2010 or pre-pandemic. Tight spending plans from April next year could further degrade services, sounding further warnings for the NHS, local government, schools and the criminal justice system. The report suggests the size of the recent Labor government election victory presents an opportunity for genuine and sustained performance improvement through a new approach to the management of public services. Across to Spain, where the Mayor of Barcelona, Jaime Colboni, plans to raise the tourist tax for cruise passengers visiting the city for less than 12 hours, 
to address the negative impacts of mass tourism. It's part of a broader effort to tackle over-tourism and improve the city's housing situation, including a ban on tourist flat rentals by 2028. The mayor wants to ensure cruise visitors contribute more to the city's economy, with potential revenue directed towards projects like installing air conditioning in schools. The Guardian has reported on growing frustration in Spain over the impact of tourism on housing and quality of life, prompting protests across the country. Speaking of air conditioning, a proposed new local law in New York City would require landlords to maintain a maximum indoor temperature of 78 degrees Fahrenheit, around 25.5 degrees Celsius, when the outdoor temperature is 82 degrees or higher, ensuring tenants receive cooling in the summer. The measure, proposed by Councilman Lincoln Restler, aims to prevent heat-related illnesses which claim about 350 lives annually in New York City. If the bill is passed, landlords will have two years to present their AC unit plans and four years to comply or face fines of up to $1,250 per day for non-compliance. And to New Zealand, Invercargill Mayor Nobby Clark may face another call to resign as another code of conduct breach is set for discussion at an extraordinary meeting of the council today. An investigation found the mayor's conduct during an interview with comedian Guy Williams where he used racial and homophobic slurs was offensive and fell short of the leadership standards required of a mayor. Today's meeting will discuss potential consequences, including a letter of censure, a public apology restricting his public duties or a vote of no confidence. Radio New Zealand reports that Councillor Clark has apologised but did not participate in the investigation, claiming the process was costly and biased. A review of Hawke's Bay Regional Council's response to Cyclone Gabriel has revealed significant failings in flood protection and preparedness. The cyclone resulted in hundreds of homes being ruined and the death of eight people. Radio New Zealand reported that the review found there was inadequate planning, outdated flood management infrastructure and insufficient community engagement. It recommended 47 actions, including better flood hazard mapping, stricter housing development rules and increased collaboration with local communities. And a New Zealand mayor has expressed concerns that the increasing level of abusive and threatening behaviour towards elected representatives will deter candidates from standing in elections next year. Why Makariri District Council has been targeted by conspiracy theories and disinformation since restrictions during the pandemic. In a story from One News, Mayor Dan Gordon said the council had increased security measures and is considering hiring staff to handle a surge in information requests driven by disinformation. He said the balance between ensuring transparency in decision-making and appropriate use of ratepayer resources is a challenge and it's expensive. Local Government New Zealand Chief Executive Susan Freeman-Green said her organisation has held discussions with police and other groups in a bid to ensure councils receive support for addressing these challenging issues. That's today's Roundup of News, but stand by now for a Roundup Extra. Noted with interest this week, the launch of Local Government Contracts Australia, a new initiative aimed at challenging the status quo in local government procurement and contracting. It plans to remove barriers and costs for small and local suppliers and streamline the process for councils to engage with quality suppliers. To find out more about this new initiative, I decided to go to the horse's mouth and I'm joined by Michael Robinson from Local Government Contracts Australia Now. Good morning, Chris. Good to be here. Great, great to have you here. I wanted to talk to you about this new initiative that you've announced called Local Government Constra- Local Government Contracts Australia. Let's just do LGCA from uh, this point forward to save For the sure. mouthful. Yeah. Uh, before we get into what you're looking to achieve here, just tell us a bit about your background in procurement in local government, Michael, because you've worked in a pretty significant procurement sort of drama issue at uh, an, at a New South Wales Council, haven't you? That's right. It, it actually, and I did mention this before, Chris, but I guess there's a little bit of family history in local government. My great uncle was the mayor of Auckland in New Zealand for over 30 years. Wow. And in fact, there's a statue of him um, outside the council. And if anybody knows anything about local government in New Zealand, they would probably know the name Dovemeyer Robinson uh, as very much a 
uh, a futurist, I guess, and what can be done in local government. So go check him out. But my foray into local government started here where I still live and work out of, Port Macquarie. So I started at Port Macquarie Hastings Council many years ago as the procurement manager following a project that is uh, somewhat synonymous in local government, that being the glass house in, in Port Macquarie, which was a project that started off at a, a reasonable budget but escalated far beyond that that led to the dismissal of the council and a lot mm-hmm. of upheaval. And so I entered local government in a very tumultuous time in, in that council's uh, time, but certainly gave me a very interesting grounding in, in the workings of local government, for sure. How, how how much is that particular incident? I think it was like a $50 million blowout, wasn't it? it That's- how much has that influenced the way that you've worked in and around the sector since that time? Yeah, profoundly. And so from that and my learnings from that, and I came from a commercial background prior to local government, and so to see some of the the stuff and the goings-ons of local government led me to be involved at a regional level. So back in the day, it was the Mid-North Coast Regional Procurement Alliance, and and I spent time uh, working at an aggregator um, for many years where we did procurement and contracts on behalf of all councils in New South Wales. And very much I have had a passion for local government and getting good governance and good practice around the construction of procurement and contracts that has led us to where we are today. And so it's very much a passion of mine and, and those that I'm working with. So you've launched uh, LGCA. You say this is born out of a vision to challenge the status quo in local government procurement and contracting in Australia. Why is that? Yeah, that's right. Look, uh, the market hasn't been challenged in over 20 years. Legislation in most jurisdictions has not changed to really accommodate that. And that is a a legislated monopoly in in a lot of cases. And what we're coming in to do is respond to the things that we've witnessed over the the last 20-odd years to, to respond to that. And some of those things are removing barriers to entry for small and local suppliers and to impose costs and download fees of tender documents is not, it, it's counterproductive to what we're trying to do to support economic development, support local suppliers. So we're looking to remove those barriers, remove those costs and actually support certainly small suppliers, but in fact all suppliers, to be able to put their best foot forward when offering their services to government. So is it like a, um, excuse the the dumb question, like a middleman approach to, to working between the supplier and the council in that scenario? That's exactly right. The intent behind any of these aggregators is to make a streamlined process for councils to engage with good quality well-credentialed suppliers, so those that have got all of their insurance, compliances and licences, so councils can more easily engage with those contractors knowing that they've met that standard. That is fundamentally part of it and what has traditionally happened. And so traditionally, aggregators have gone out to a tender through a publicly open tender process for a certain category where suppliers can in some cases, pay to get those tender documents. But in most cases, they can go and look at those tender documents and then decide to bid to get onto one of those panels. And they've got a tender time frame to do that. And, you know, the the imposition that a lot of these tender processes have on small and regional businesses is quite unrealistic. And an example of that might be if we've got very small local works and service providers. We we work with little providers that might own a small trucking company. And to ask them for things like their modern slavery statements and a whole range of of new legislated requirements is an imposition for a lot of small suppliers that aren't familiar with what it even means, let alone whether they're able to support it. And so we're trying to shift the paradigm that rather than judging suppliers, through that tender process, we're actually supporting suppliers to say, okay, 
you may not have a modern modern slavery statement for your company yet. We're not going to judge you down for that. We're going to recognise that and actually support you so that you can understand those initiatives and the good pursuits that the legislation is trying to drive. So it's really shifting the paradigm from judging those suppliers at the front end to supporting them and helping them understand and build their capacity. But where LGCA will be different from the the more common, more current process is Mm. that from that point, councils are fundamentally and suppliers are fundamentally left to figure it out from themselves. And so some examples of that is that if I'm a council and I reference one of these contracts and noted on a purchase order, going through no competitive quotes, through no process whatsoever, technically in most states that's deemed compliant because they've used a supplier from one of these aggregated contracts. And the supplier is fundamentally left to do all of the sales work, to build the proposals, to engage with the council and then pay the aggregator a commission for having been on that panel. And where LGCA is going to be very different is that our focus is on supporting the suppliers and the councils engage in a reasonable way that we drive competition, that we ensure quotes are achieved as best as is practical, and there's that common understanding and the engagement between the contractor and the council. And so we want to make sure that there is good governance with a reasonable amount of rigour, but is a more streamlined process to engage and, and bring the supplier and the buyer together. And the so ways Michael, that is fundamentally different. Michael, I can see why uh, you know a lot of suppliers would welcome this because it's going to make it easier for them to participate in the process. How do you think councils might respond to this? Yeah, look, the feedback that I've had so far is supportive. And look, good procurement is not about putting up barriers or being the speed hump or something that you need to navigate around. Procurement in any council is should be a customer service unit to the rest of the organisation. And really, the only people that would have any reason to object to what we're doing from a council perspective is if that they are fundamentally perhaps taking some shortcuts that maybe they shouldn't. And so what we we often see, and, you know, I operate as a probity advisor as well, and that people are fundamentally good and trying to take the path of least resistance to get their work done. And, you know, we work with engineers and project managers and, you know, I applaud all of them and, and understand they're just trying to get their projects delivered. So their pursuits may not be how many quotes they get or, you know, some of the steps that are required. But the reality is when we work in local government or any level of government, we've got a requirement to fulfil our obligations in terms of reporting and due diligence and good governance. And yeah. so we're going to make sure that that good governance is upheld. And I would like to think councillors, the community, senior leaders within councils would be extremely supportive of that, so that we're making sure that the staff are not taking the path of least resistance that might jeopardise the integrity of the council. I can see already from your announcement on LinkedIn, you've had some senior leaders from councils welcoming the concept and a lot of others as well. And I think probably fair to say some are waiting to see how this might play out. How do you think it will play out? What are your measures for success here, Michael? Oh, absolutely. My my measures for success is going to be the rate or the numbers of those engagements. And so, look, this is a massive exercise to bring this whole thing to fruition. And we've really announced this. We've taken this a long way in terms of preparing for it, in terms of policies, procedures and systems. And But we're at the point now that we are effectively seeking the expressions of interest. So through those news articles and more promotion that will be going out. We're encouraging both suppliers and council buyers to register through the website. It's literally just uh, an email address and your name just to make sure that you are uh, uh, somebody working for local government. But equally for suppliers, if you're able to provide those basic details, we're going to keep capturing that enthusiasm. We're going to continue to do some information sessions through online sessions and and potentially live sessions for both buyers and suppliers to understand all of this much more. 
as you'll see, we're recruiting staff to, to fill some positions. And so the intent is this, we're looking at for it to really go live probably in the next three months. And when I say live, being at a point where councils can engage with those contractors and start to get quotes and the like. Probably my realistic expectation is that we're putting all of this in place to really go uh, live fully uh, towards the start of the new year. So give ourselves six months. If we can get yeah. going for sooner, great, but that's the realistic expectation. Well, we'd love to hear about an innovative new idea and a disruptor, as you call it in this case, in the procurement space. And of course, you've got the background in local government. So that's half the battle, people understanding how the system currently works to be able to then enable these sorts of improvements, isn't it? It, it is, Chris. And, and I would say that, you know, there, there'd be some people that listen to, to this podcast and maybe not fully appreciate or, or understand what we're talking about today, because it is a very specific area. But those that are working in that space will well and truly understand where I'm coming from. And certainly, as I've said to, to certain local government ministers, that we're doing this for the right reasons. We're doing this from the lessons learnt that I've learnt from way back when at Port Macquarie Council and Port Macquarie Hastings Council and really trying to improve the way the engagement happens between councils and suppliers to mitigate those risks and provide good value for all. Our audience includes a lot of chief executives, general managers, other senior executives. Hopefully this might prompt them to find out a bit more about what you're uh, trying to achieve here, Michael. So thanks very much for telling us about it. Good on you. Thanks, Chris. And yeah, probably final thought is that for, for any senior managers, please go and have a look and consider it. And if it's an option worth considering, that's what we're trying to promote, that there is choice out there. And, and we want what's best for councils. So thanks for your time, Chris. What's the best way to do that, Michael, before you go, how, to go and have a look? Yeah, thank you. Best way to do that is to jump onto the website, so www.lgca.com.au, and you can register there and certainly find out a lot more information. We'll certainly be doing a lot more promotion through LinkedIn and other means as well. But certainly, um, Chris, you got the world exclusive today, so congratulations um, on this. So, um, And, yeah, really thankful for being here and, and having the opportunity to discuss it. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I know you've been a long-term listener and supporter of the podcast almost since day one, I think. So, uh, so thanks for that as well. And great to see you and talk to you today. Thanks, Chris. And that's today's podcast. Thank you very much for listening. That was edition number 367, recorded Friday the 26th of July 2024 and brought to you as always by the Victorian Local Governance Association, the national broadcaster on all things local government. You can find the links to the stories referenced in the episode and a full transcript at lgnewsroundup.com. The Roundup is recorded in the city of Greater Geelong, Victoria, on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I'll be back with more news on Monday. Until next time, thanks for listening and bye for now.